on web Facebook. Thank you everyone for joining us for the Taiwan 228 Government Atrocities Prevention Seminar. I'm Alex Chen, I'm honored to be your host. This event is not only to commemorate the atrocities in Taiwan from February 28, 1947, but to also remind everyone that we must work together to prevent atrocities throughout the world. Today, we're very lucky to be able to host these important presenters who will cover Taiwan, Hong Kong, Uyghurs, two presenters on Rohingya, and Hispanic and Puerto Rico. The presenters will be followed by a Q&A of 15 minutes, where we select a few questions from the audience. Please send me, your host, private messages or questions throughout the chat, and I will select a few. Here are our remarks for our Papa President, LA President, Tony Lee. Uh, dear friends, welcome to the fifth Henry Government Atrocity Prevention event by Formosa Association for Public Public Affairs, Los Angeles Chapter and the Formosa Association for Human Rights. We started this event five years ago. When we felt the need for the world to learn about the Taiwan's tragedy past 
that happened more than 74 years ago, the 2-2-A massacre caused so much friend, so much tra trauma to the Taiwanese people and the cover-ups and the suppression that come afterwards. We are still suffering from the efforts caused by the terrible atrocity today. We feel the war didn't, didn't care much for what happened to the Taiwan, and we feel the Main Street overlook our pain. However, we realize it will be far more meaningful if we can also open our hearts and minds to learn about similar pain and suffering endured by other nations and cultural groups. Instead of being stuck in self-pity, we shall try to raise, rise from it by helping others and the first step to understand and be informed about what other people have been through. The object of our annual event is to provide an opportunity of sharing and the mature educating and the hope the knowledge we learn from each other can help us not feel alone. And it will lead us to pave a better future for our future generation. A, fu a future that can pre prevent those tragedies from happening again. Our board member, Kiwu, write to me this following message about the genocide. Mass killings have been going on throughout the human history. It's more a regular occurrence than an operations in 1944, a party Jewish lawyer, Raphael Lemkin, coins the term genocide to describe lost mass killing. He limited to definition of genocide to include ethnic, religious, and the national groups. However, some scholars later indicate that he shall in, include not just ethnic, religious, and national groups, but also social, economic, and political groups that's based on the evidence of the mass deaths of the Ukraine by starting in 1932 to 1933. Mass murder of the son half a million Indonesian communists in 1965 to 1966, the Cambodian genocide in the 1970s. In the present convention, genocide means any of the foreign acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, and the religious group as such. Number one, killing member of the group. Number two, causing serious bodily or mentally harm to the member of the group. Deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of the life calculate to bring about the physical destruction in whole or in part. Impose, number four, imposing measures intend to prevent births within the group. Number five, first of all, trans transferring children of the group to another group, apparently happened in the Tibetan and Uyghur. Our by every chapter in Formosa Association of Human Rights has continued to hold this program for five years. We will continue to do so every year. Let me briefly introdu introduce the HUAPA. Formosa Association for Public, Public Affairs, which is 44 chapter and the thousands of members, have been the leading voice for Taiwan since 1982. The organization provides U.S. policymakers, the media scholars, and the general public with information on issues related to the Taiwan. Papa informs and updates members of Congress and their staff on issues regarding Taiwan. Papa seek and articulate the points of the view of the people of the Taiwan so it helps maintain 
a healthy and sorry relationship between the U.S. and Taiwan. Hua Pamin, main mission is to promote international support for the right of the people, people of the Taiwan to establish an independent and a de democratic country and to join the international community, improve the U.S.-Taiwan relations, protect the right of self-determination for the people of the Taiwan, promote peace and security for Taiwan, and advance the fight, the rights, and the interests of the Taiwanese communities through the war. Those goals will be very difficult to achieve without friends and allies in the process. So it's my sincerest wish to thank you for being here as our friend and ally as we you, are yours. Together, we can build a better future and achieve our goals. Thank you. Our first, our first presenter is Zhang Haozun, Director of Taipei Economic Cultures Office, Culture Center. Please unmute yourself. Yes, hello, good afternoon. Yes, I'm Peter Zhang. Yes, wish the seminar a complete success. Thank you. Okay, yeah, finish. Yes, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next, we have Professor Jerry Liu. Committee member of FAPA you may unmute and proceed. Thank you, Jerry. I think Jerry may be having issues. So we are going to go with our next presenter and jump back with Jerry after. Please welcome Professor Charles Lam, representative from Hong Kong Forum of LA. You may unmute yourself and proceed. Thank you. Charles? Okay. So can you see, see the screen and hear me well? Loud and clear. All right, thank you very much. Okay, so I'm Charles Lam. I'm a representative from Hong Kong Forum Los Angeles. Hong Kong Forum Los Angeles was formed after the June 4th um, massacre in 1989, and this year is our 30th anniversary. And so we have been now in LA concerning about the issues of Hong Kong democracy for the past 30 years. Um, and we hold local events um, to um, generate interest about Hong Kong to the community. And some of our members also engage actively with the United States government. So today, the my, my talk was about um, Hong Kong under the national security law. And um, I want to provide an update with you what happened this past year in Hong Kong. Um, basically, Hong Kong has changed so much in the past year. And even with the latest update that happened just about 12 hours ago, that Hong Kong is now no longer recognizable as like a liberal city as before. So last year, Hong Kong suffered a pandemic just like the rest of the world. 
there was the anti-extradition movement that started in June 2019 and it has been ongoing ever since. Before the pandemic started hitting, demonstrations were ongoing. We had protests almost every week, even though it's slowing down, but people still go out on the streets. The demonstrations were ongoing until we caught hold of the pandemic. And Hong Kong was one of the frontiers in this pandemic because of the connections with China, there was high-speed rail, and there were lots of travelers that fly through Hong Kong to the rest of the world. And so Hong Kong received the first case of COVID-19 at the end of January. And since then, the government has established um, draconian laws, basically using it to curb the protests rather than trying to prevent the pandemic. So the demonstrations ongoing and there and towards the end of 2019, actually the government in um, instilled a anti-mask law prohibiting people from wearing masks on the street because they were deemed protesters and the police wanted to use visual or, um, equipment to identify all the protesters so they're not allowed to wear masks. Anyone wearing a mask in the protest were deemed illegal. And basically the day that the pandemic hit, this law no longer exists. Everyone wear masks on the street and just like everywhere else in the world, we're also uh, short of face masks. So a lot of the a lot of people brought out the old equipment of gas masks that were originally used in the protest to prevent them from inhaling tear gas and other things. And they were on the street and the police did nothing because now it is used to prevent the, um, the pandemic. Um, the reason why I'm saying that the government laws were not intended to prevent the spread of the disease is because there was no travel ban. And there was, in particularly, there was no travel ban, even though the majority of Hong Kong, Hong Kong people requested that the government close the borders to mainland China, except for goods, the government had been refusing to do so to the point that the medical workers decided to launch a strike to force the government to close the border. And the government did not give in, and now the medical workers are actually facing uh, disciplinary actions because of their actions um, to actually what they're trying to do is to protect Hong Kongers from getting the disease. Um, and in the next few months, protests did start to die out, but um, but then the actions from the police started to escalate. The police became emboldened and they started to lay out charges for all the things that happened in 2019. Um, basically, there was no legal protest or government authorized protests since August. And as I mentioned to you is that there were daily protests, uh, weekly protests. And so the, um, the Hong Kong police start to arrest all the organizers um, between the months of January and June. And many, many, many people were arrested. And these are all peaceful protesters. These are all organizers of peaceful protests. Um, they were um, arrested one by one. And some of these arrests even dated before the anti-tradition movement, um, as Hong Kong also had protests before that. Um, as a result, the United States um, declared Hong Kong no longer autonomous on May 27th by the State Department. Um, and at the same time, there were already rumors that the Beijing government is intolerant of what happens in Hong Kong and start to crack down. And um, there were rumors that a national security law would be enacted. And on July 1st, the national security law was enacted in Hong Kong without any proper consultation from Hong Kong people. Hong Kong people protested or voiced out their opposition for a month um, to no avail, to no avail. Nobody listened. So what's the national security law? In fact, it was required under Article 23 of the Basic Law of Hong Kong, which is sort of the mini constitution for Hong Kong established for the handover. There have been failed attempts in the past. In 2003, there was a major attempt to establish law. And at that time, the only concern, it was actually um, 
um, okay by most of Hong Kong people, except the concern is that there were not enough protections for the press. And that we found that at the time, the, the way that it was written, um, um, the reporters may have may may succumb to the law. And so um, 500,000 people of Hong Kong took to the streets just right after SARS and protested against it. And then the government withdrew um, withdrew the, the legislation and multiple um, government officers resigned. And then since then, it was basically not, uh, it was mentioned every now and then, but no um, government in Hong Kong wanted to dare to raise this issue. That is until very recently. In July 2020, this is what the Beijing government did. Instead of asking Hong Kong government to establish the law itself that is required under the basic law that says Hong Kong government should have the responsibility and the sole initiative to, to establish this law, the National People's Congress in Beijing decided to just create a law and insert into the basic law Annex 3 without any consultation. And there, the power actually lies in the NPCSC that they can indeed do so. And by inserting this law, this suddenly became the law of the land. And besides this, there was a special unit set up inside Hong Kong, the police force. Um, we don't know who composes this. It was, it was housed inside the Hong Kong police force. And we don't, also, we don't know the budget. Basically, this became a black box unit hidden inside the Hong Kong police force to enact the Hong Kong base, uh, the, this um, uh, national security law. And this is the biggest threat to the autonomy of Hong Kong yet. And what we see in the last six months is that there is a rapid deterioration. So what appears in this law? Actually, it was actually some, in, in terms of the, the, the types of um, uh, charges that were included in this law, this is no different from uh, national security laws in many countries. There are talks about secession, subversion, terrorist acts, and collusion with foreign country. And all of these happen in many countries, I'm sure including in many liberal democracies as well. The problem is that just like anything within the Chinese system is that we would not um, trust the way that things are interpreted. And in fact, the NPCSC also has the ultimate interpretation of all of these laws. So uh, they can say whatever they wanted, and this is where the problem is. In fact, one very big example that happened just today was that 47 politicians in Hong Kong were charged with subversion. Okay, so what did they do? What they did was last year in November, we were supposed to have a legislative council election, and therefore in July, um, the pro-democracy side, there were many different parties. They decided to run a primary election to, to determine who gets to be on the ballot. And the reason is they want to have a better representation of the people on their side, and also to try to maximize the chances of getting elected. And there is nothing wrong with this. This is basically just an opinion poll. What they did was to set up some mechanism so that people can voice their opinion and then they can decide who to run in election. Now, they were charged with subversion, the conspiracy to overturn, or overthrow the government of Hong Kong. And I don't honestly, I don't know why they're conducting a poll would be equivalent to overthrowing the government. And other major problem with this legislation is extraterritorial jurisdiction. This is Article 38. What it says is that this law applies to not only events that happen inside Hong Kong, but it says this law shall apply to offenses under this law committed against the Hong Kong Special Administrative Region from outside the region by a person who is not a permanent resident of the region. That means anyone that speak against the Hong Kong or the Beijing government anywhere in the world is now a criminal. And one particular person that is noted is Samuel Chu 
is the direct managing director of Hong Kong Democracy Council in Washington, D.C. He is an American. A few days after this law was enacted, he was issued an arrest warrant by the Hong Kong government. So now he is an international fugitive as an American living in the United States. So what happened in Hong Kong during this period, these last six months? The original intention of the establishment of this law is to be, that is not retroactive. So as long as once after this law is established, if you don't do any of those activities, then it should be fine. However, one of the activists, Agnes Chow, she is only a 22, 23-year-old um, activist, and she was being arrested for, again, under the national security law for things that she did before the national security law was enacted. And at this stage, with the 47 that were arrested and detained now, close to 150 political activists and politicians and lawyers, one of them is actually a white American lawyer that resides in Hong Kong, a human rights lawyer, John Clancy, were arrested under this law. Now, most of these arrests do not qualify, as I mentioned, as a national security threat in most countries. And this shows how that this law has been so draconian. Now, I can cite you another statement in the National Security Law on Subversion. It says that if you're caught attacking or damaging the pre premises or facilities used by the body of power of Hong Kong Special Administrative Region, then you're also liable under this law. Or if you are seriously interfering in disrupting or undermining the performance and duties of the government, then it's considered subversion. So if you go into protest and you surround the building and then your, your um, um, uh, government workers cannot go out, then you might be charged for subversion. Or if you walk around, if you're walking on the street and you s decide to you know, throw trash and that the trash happen to hit the building or that that may have put a dent on the building, then you might, could be charged for subversion. It depends on what they want to do because they can interpret in whatever way they wanted for this law. And with this law, police became very emboldened to basically make all kinds of arrests. Now, there were some arrests that eventually did not stand the test of the law and they were thrown out of the court because they even the lawyers, uh, even the judges said that it was ridiculous. But the problem is that most of, in some of these cases, the judges after that were being bullied or they were being replaced by other judges taking charge of these cases. And so there is also no uh, real protection by the courts because then after the court, the judges were replaced, then the um, government can actually appeal, and some of these were eventually put to jail as well. All prominent politicians affected, um, Martin Lee, which you call the, the father of democracy in Hong Kong, was also charged for illegal assembly. Uh, Jimmy Lai, uh, who owns Apple Daily Press in both Hong Kong and Taiwan, is now facing multiple charges, and he's not even allowed bail. And on top of that, so now there are seriously threats to the right of freedom of speech, association, and freedom of assembly. Um, basically, there were no, as I mentioned, there was no um, government allowed protests anymore. And even at this stage, because of the pandemic, they're using pandemic as, as an excuse. So if you have a group of four on the streets gathering, that might be liable to the law as well. And there were families that have been being prosecuted like this. And, and they were not even protesting. They were not even doing anything. They were just on the street and they were young and they got arrested. Um, is there any democracy? Hong Kong government will keep on telling you that there's still democracy. There's still fair elections in Hong Kong. Yes, the elections may be fair, but if you are not for the government, you get elected, then there are many, many different ways that the government is, is looking up to get you disqualified. It may even be before you run for the election. They will disqualify you once you submit the application to run. 
all that, you might say just something wrong and then you get arrested. And at this stage, there is actually no opposition voice at all in the legislature. There's no pro-democracy representative in the legislature at all. They all either resign on protests or they get arrested or disqualified. What Beijing wanted, and as what Hong Kong people claim is Hong Kong government claim is that there is still opposition. Look at these people. They were, they do not agree with government all the time. Yes, they speak out again uh, against some of the policy sometimes, but then they voted for the government always. And these we, we call it um, loyal opposition. And um, because of this, some dissidents have fled Hong Kong, including Nathan Law, who is now in the United Kingdom, and um, many other activists that were previously in Hong Kong, they left early enough that they can escape. Right now, they cannot escape anymore. In education, it's the same situation. We can see evidence of censorship in academia and the press. You can see that any panels that discuss the, in the situation in Hong Kong and China, sometimes these ac academics refuses to answer certain questions because of fear of prosecution. And you can see that the press has significantly curbed the, um, the tone in reporting the situations. Schools were also encouraged to report to police and record all suspicious acts by both students and teachers to the police. So if a student decided to protest or stage any actions within the school, they might have to report the schools are encouraged to report it to the police. Even the police says no, but they'll ask. Uh, schools are also required to implement national security education in the curriculum to let the students know what does it mean by going against the government. Uh, they were uh, asked to implement national education to learn to be patriotic. I understand this also appears in many liberal democracies in many countries, but in the case of CCP, that's a whole different animal. Um, there's another thing that is also happening, which is that Hong Kong has a um, public exam in the, um, in the uh, secondary school system, in high school system, and liberal studies is one of the curriculum originally designed to encourage students to have critical thinking. And that in this exam, there is almost no right or wrong answer, but what we test out is the students should be able to synthesize information and express their opinion or to write a report. And this is what the industry wanted. But after 10, uh, after 15 years of implementing this curriculum, um, what the government and the CCP um, officials in Hong Kong see is that this curriculum was the reason why that the younger generation decided to come out to protest because now they have the free thinking ability and that they see the problem of CCP. And so they forced the Hong Kong education system to revise this curriculum so that this curriculum no longer has to talk about politics or government policies and that the weight of this curriculum in university education is significantly reduced. And they are hoping that this will create a next generation that is totally obedient rather than having critical thoughts. Um, but on the other hand, this is going to kill the entire Hong Kong workforce in the future. We'll not have a workforce that is capable of having critical thinking uh, skills and um, be a um, highly skilled 21st century workforce. So they, while they are trying to keep the political power, they essentially are killing Hong Kong at the same time. In domestic life, people have lost confidence. As you can see on the chart, the black line is the, is the difference of popularity of um, Carrie Lam, the chief executive, the approval rating minus the disapproval rating. And Right now, um, Carrie Lam has an approval rating of 18% versus the approval rating of 70%, with, and so her score is minus 52%. As you can see on this chart is that um, the blue line is the Secretary of Justice, which is essentially the person leading up to the establishment of this 
national security law, and she suffers basically the same uh, fate as well. The overall or effects to Hong Kong in summary is that we have now explicit self censorship. Um, the independent press is severely suppressed. Sometimes they're not even allowed to show up at press conferences or go inside buildings to do their regular reporting. The courts are severely weakened, and in fact, they were not allowed to interpret the law as in the spirit of common law. Sometimes they were just being instructed to interpret the way that the National People's Congress interpret the law. Um, there is an uncontrolled police force. The police, Hong Kong police force is basically used as a tool for the CCP to enact all their laws. The CCP does not even need to send in the army to Hong Kong. They just use the Hong Kong police force to do everything that they wanted them to do. And it creates a, a, a sort of book screen that it was the Hong Kong government that, that is responsible for everything. And Hong Kong, Hong Kong still has autonomy. But that autonomy is actually not there, even though it looks like it's an, an autonomy because it's enacted by Hong Kong police. The government is now essentially a public government. The direction of the city, the policy making is totally directed by the Beijing government. Um, the NGOs that are enacted that are operating in Hong Kong now has to be very careful because one small step and they will face the same fate as the NGOs in mainland China. There's a lot, and, and as a result, this is a long-term weakening of all forms of checks to the government. As you can see, everything that is about was set up to basically provide a check, to check and balance to the Hong Kong government. And none of that is, any, is effective any longer. So what happens in the United States? In the United States, um, in before, many Hong Kong politicians would visit Washington DC to talk to politicians here and discuss about uh, the situation in Hong Kong. All of these connections have essentially stopped because under the collusion with, uh, un under the statement of collusion with foreign governments, if you talk to a politician outside of Hong Kong to other countries, and if you even mention the word sanction, then you are you can be charged under the national security law as trying to overthrow the government as well and so there is no connection and even for us as activists we have to stop all communications with hong kong politicians as well because we don't want them to get into trouble legislation by the united states government um we were grateful for the congress to act on it um, we have hong kong human rights and democracy act we have another act to prohibit export of firearms to Hong Kong police. And then we have a Hong Kong Autonomy Act, which sets the stage for all the sanctions. And then we have House and Senate resolutions as well. So to those, we're very grateful for, for this to, hap to happen. Um, and then there were sanctions by the United States government, including um, our Chief Executive Carrie Lam, the Secretary of Justice Theresa Chang, and many other um, major government officials, and there was a joke saying, um, as that Carrie Lam actually went on TV saying that no banks wants to uh, do business with her, so now she has tons of cash at home because she cannot store cash at, um, at banks, and, and we joke that now we have, to, um, we have to have a mass fundraise to buy tin cans for her to store cash at home. At overseas actions, um, Right now, pretty much all the Hong Kong groups all over the world are doing exactly the same thing. We are trying to help Hong Kongers leave. And so um, we're very grateful that the Taiwanese government actually allowed Hong Kongers to travel and stay in Taiwan, even during the pa pandemic, when uh, travel is closed to almost the entire world, to which we are really, really grateful. And because of this, some of the Hong Kongers who left early were able to flag the city before they were arrested. Um, the United Kingdom also um, has a new campaign to allow um, about 3 million Hong Kong people who hold a uh, colonial period British national overseas passport to move to UK and then eventually apply for immigration. And Canada two weeks ago also announced a 
bill uh, also announced an action to increase and expedite um, uh, immigration from Hong Kong as well, trying to get as many people out as possible. And I'm finishing very soon. Thank you, Alex. Um, and U.S. has failed some. Um, U.S. Ha has also introduced some bills in the last Congress, but both of them failed. Uh, the Hong Kong People's Freedom and Choice Act passed the House, but failed in the Senate, and the Hong Kong Safe Harbor that was next, but never voted on. Uh, currently, there is the Hong Kong Safe Harbor Act that was reintroduced as well. Uh, we encourage everyone to help lobby for the um, for the bill. Um, the challenge is that Hong Kong people cannot leave. Uh, Hong Kong police would detain dissidents at the airport so that they would miss their flight as a warning, and most of the people were not able to leave uh, because of this. Uh, the challenges for us is that even former Hong Kong residents living here, we are not feeling very safe. Uh, many are hesitant on talking to politicians here even because if they're found, they might be liable to the law in Hong Kong, and most of them still have relatives in Hong Kong, um, and let alone that they're afraid to visit Hong Kong. And therefore, if you see our actions, uh, we have protests, say, for example, this one in Monterey Park, um, we usually wear masks, um, and we think that we're likely, most of us are going to wear masks even after the pandemic, because we need to hide our identities, even though we're coming in protests. Uh, we are all fear of intimidation. Um, we all also agree that now Hong Kong is almost lost and that Taiwan becomes the last frontier and we need to try everything to protect Taiwan. Okay, so uh, that will be the end of my talks. I'm sorry I went a bit over time. If any questions, I will open to questions that you may have. Please submit the questions at the on the chat privately to us, and uh, we'll answer questions at the end of all the presenters. Uh, thank you, Professor Lam, for your presentation, Hong Kong. We follow it very closely. Uh, next, we have uh, Professor Jerry Liu, committee member of FAPA LA. Okay, hi all. I'm sorry, it took me a while to get on. <laughs> Um, when we first, when the, this usually the time of February 28th is usually commemorate the massacre that occurred on February 28th, 1947. Now, over the years, we've kind of had events to celebrate or to remember what had happened during that time frame. Now, the reason why we were originally supposed to talk first, or I was supposed to talk first, was because we wanted to kind of start the framework of what we thought was important for human rights and human rights atrocities that's going around globally. Now, obviously, this was not the very first time, nor will it possibly be the last. We will continuously see this, um, and particularly now, we are seeing a lot of this happening with a lot of the people that are surrounding in Asia as well as the, uh, all over the world. And so when we start, uh, as Taiwanese, we start thinking about what has happened over the years and has happened to Taiwan and how that is mimicked by other places around the world. When, when the Chinese came to Taiwan uh, post-World War II, there was a huge flock because of the the Japanese occupation had receded back into Japan and the island was kind of unoccupied. And what happened was the Chinese uh, soldiers came leaving from China, basically fled to Taiwan. The Kuomintang soldiers that got defeated by the Chinese Communist Party with Mao Zedong really kind of fled as fast as they could, taking whatever they could and brought it over to the island. At the same time was they had a bunch of people living on the island that had their own culture, their own language, their own system of government. But when the Chinese came about, they took it over as soon as possible. The problem was that the people residing on the island were not the same type of people and they didn't have the same beliefs or the same systems in terms of government, of how things were run. And the Chinese, when they came about, they decided that they would needed to control the people living on the island. On February 28, 1947, there was a incident that had happened where a 
tobacco vendor was selling tobacco cigarettes and so forth. And some of the officials, government officials uh, set forth by the Kuomintang Chinese government decided to take this person as an example and to beat this person. It resulted into a anti-government uprising that happened and in the course of 13 days, roughly about 20 to 30,000 Taiwanese people were killed. And since that time, they, they were basically went into martial law right afterwards. And for the next 50 years, what we call the white terror basically instilled on the island nation. What had happened was people would go missing in the middle of the night. Secret police would prosecute, kidnap, torture and murder individuals. You would not see your family members the following day. They would go missing and no one really talked about it on top of everything else. Even after that 50 year period, we never talked about it. It was never mentioned in the history books. It was never talked about amongst friends because you didn't know who was listening, who would report you to the government and then all of a sudden you would go missing or someone you knew or loved would go missing in the middle of the night. Over the course of the many years that has happened, we started thinking about what this was about. We started to bring into light and started to ask the government, we need to understand and recognize what has happened. So over the last so many years, we've 75 years, even though it has happened, we still think about how this is affecting our daily lives in Taiwan. What has happened in the last five years basically is we are trying to, in, in Taiwan, basically trying to pass laws to recognize what has happened and possibly hold, hold the Kuomintang government responsible for what has happened to the Taiwanese people over the so many years. Even though martial law has been lifted, this white terror still holds deep in all our hearts and in our souls, and we watch carefully of what is happening. Thus, in Taiwan, it is very, very big on understanding why this is such a big deal and why this is such a anti-government or kind of a totalitarian government issue that we cannot ever go back to. And so because of this, we want to make sure that we never, ever forget. Oh, thank you. Oh, let me uh, unshare. Unshare. Oops. Thank you, Dr. Liu, for your presentation on Sorry. Taiwan. Stop sharing. Thank you. Now we have... Please welcome Dr. Nunisa Kerbin, board member of Uyghur LA. You may unmute and proceed. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Thank, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for FAPA for organizing such a wonderful event. This is my third year, actually. Um, and I started, uh, well, I was invited to present back in 2019. Charles, Jerry, I remember our presentation for the first time. And um, it was, I'm always, uh, you know, look forward to this event every year. But unfortunately, um, our PowerPoint slides, our stories are keeping getting lo bigger, longer, and so much to talk about. Um, this the sadness and heartbreak is uh, this continues to add on to our our suffering. And I, I ache for you, uh, Charles, um, just hearing how devastating this atrocities in Hong Kong in terms of um, how the the Chinese government is continued to crack down on the human rights and, and democracy that we always look, I personally looked up to um, as long as, as I remember. And I'm just, uh, I, I stay with you in solidarity. Um, let me quickly share my screen. Um, let me see. Sorry, I'm having a hard time. Um, my PowerPoint slides right there. Okay. All right. Did I share or no? <laughs> Not yet, right? Share. Okay. Here we go. 
Can you see my, my presentation? Not yet. Not yet. Okay. Um, uh, it's, it says connecting. I don't know why. Maybe that's why. Um, I, I I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the uh, with the genocide, and now I'm comfortably declare that the atrocities that are taking place in East Turkestan is indeed genocide, and we've been working very hard to um, bring the attention to our our cause. And as you know, back in last year on on 19th of 2021. The United States uh, declared the, uh, the crime against Uyghurs and other minorities in East Turkestan as genocide, and it it this and the new government, uh, U.S. government, also reiterated that they are going to stand with the decision of the previous government. And um, last week, uh, Canada Parliament also um, a motion to acknowledge the atrocities as genocide and it followed by Dutch government as well. So that means that with the hard work of um, Uyghurs in, inside East Turkestan and abroad, and also friends like you who care about us and stood by us, um, our hard work has started to pay off and started to raise more awareness. And that is at least something that I can share as a good news. Um, I'm sorry, my presentation is still says connecting. Maybe I can, um, as as um, as I mentioned, my name is Nurnisa Kurban. I am Uyghur American who I live in Los Angeles. Um, this is my 23rd year in Los Angeles, and I'm also a member of um, uh, uh, the organization called Uyghur LA. Um, I'm representing here uh, on behalf of, for my. Um, over 300 Uyghur population in Los Angeles, and most importantly, the Uyghurs around the world. Um, and I'm also a mother of two and 17-year um, veteran educator at LAUSD. Um, um, and also, um, I'm basically, I spend whole 20, 23 years of my life in Los Angeles. Um, Maybe I should cancel this, share again, one more time. Okay, it's, 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 it, I, let me see. Is there anyone that can go ahead and present? Maybe I can pick up where I left off. I'm sorry, my, my uh, computer says it's connecting. I don't know if I'm having a connection problem or is this something that I'm, not doing it right because no i really want to share i really want to share my presentation i have some visuals that might help our audience better understand so so do you want me to continue then? Jerry, Alex? Well, um, maybe you could, could send us your presentation. We'll have you come back in if we get your presentation back on. But uh, okay. thank you, Dr. Kerbin, for your uh, speech on Uyghurs. It is so sad that what's happening there. Um, we'll go to Mr. Koko Neng, president of uh, LA Rohingya Association. And we'll come back to you if we get your presentation up yes. and running. I apologize. Thank you so much. Okay. Good afternoon. Thank you, FAPB, for inviting me again. Uh, this is my second year. Uh, my name is Kokonai. I'm from the Los Angeles Rohingya Association. So, you know, let me share my slide and I'm going to introduce uh, what's going on in the Rohingya crisis. And also, interestingly, there is a coup going on in Burma, known as Myanmar. So it collides with the Rohingya crisis. So, of course, uh, we as a Rohingya are deeply concerned about this.
Okay. Uh, can everyone see the screen? We still have a black screen. There we go. Oh, there you go. There we go. Great. Okay, let me. So my name is Kokonai. I am from the Los Angeles Ronja Association. So a quick background about uh, Los Angeles Ronja Association. Uh, we have been around since 2011. You know, ever, ever since uh, there was a genocide going on. But definitely prior to that, there has been so many genocide going on against the Rohingya minority in Burma, uh, known as Myanmar now, but uh, by the US government in the US Western country, uh, they still call it Burma. Uh, they changed only the Burmese government, the military junta, they call the name Myanmar. But uh, most of the world, you know, they call it Burma, including us. Uh, we Rohingya like to call it Burma because that's the original name given. Okay, let me talk about the latest coup and what's going on. And I will introduce uh, what is the Rohingya. We Rohingya are the indigenous uh, minority people in located in Western part of Burma known as Arkan, Arkan state. You know, we have been then since the early 12th centuries as an independent kingdom, you know, before, you know, Burma was founded. We didn't go to Burma. Burma came to us, you know, Burma was, you know, colonized by the Burmese kingdom, and, and uh, unfortunately that time, and then followed by, you know, the British uh, colonization came about, uh, you know, we were also part of that too, and then followed by, you know, the Japanese occupation, all they you know, we all went through a lot of massacre, even by the Japanese, then followed by the military, you know, Burma has a deep connection with the military. Yes, no doubt, the, you know, the country was founded on a military principle, uh, Bojo Aung San, uh, who is the father of the Aung San Suu Kyi. I'm going to talk about her too. Uh, he's the one that found, he's the one that, you know, free Burma from British fought for independence. Of course, definitely we give credit to him. But un unfortunately, Burma was founded on military principle. You know, the country have so many junta, you know, and everything. All. So there have been so many crises going on. So, so let me talk about why and how, how the coup in Burma happened in the background. Like I mentioned early on, throughout its decades of independence from Britain, Burma struggled with so many civil war. In Burma alone, we are, there's more than 130 ethnic minorities. Let me just name a few because I cannot really name all the 130 minor ethnic minorities, including Rohingya. Uh, there's Shan, Kachin, Karen, you know, all, all this, and they include Rohingya and Kaman. You know, we are the indigenous Muslim minority. There's also a Christian minority known as Chin. So the Chin crew, uh, they are predominantly all Christian. So Burma has, you know, has struggled with, you know, civil war, you know, isolation from the global affairs because of the military culture. And also is one of the poorest country in Southeast Asia, you know, because of the military corruption. You know, no doubt Burma has rich natural resources, you know, such as jades, oils, and minerals. You know, of course, because of that, you know, China is also eyeing on that policy. I'm also going to talk about China. How is China playing a strong factor, you know, in focusing on their one belt roof, one belt roof initiative to, you know, to, uh, to take advantage of uh, poor countries' resources. You know, I, like I mentioned, you know, Burma, you know, they have been, you know, sanctioned by the Western government since way before 1962, when military junta Newing took power, you know, they were isolated, you know, the U.S. never recognized them, you know, they were sanctioned going on and everything. And then because of the, you know, the military realized, you know, oh, we are, we are going to go down, we're not getting the share of the Western share of gold. So they are, they approached to open up a partial democracy in early 2011, the military claim they want to give a, like a partial military installed transition government, you know, which you know, military will some influence, have some influence in it. As you can see in the picture, this is a general Ming online, who is the current, you know, dictator of Burma, you know, he using the name of democracy, lying to the whole world, you know, he committed genocide, not just on uh, Rohingya minorities, also on other ethnic minorities where there's ongoing, you know, conflict going on in Shan, Kachin and Korean. So, you know, we don't recognize him as a leader, no doubt he's a military junta. You know, he's one of the mastermind of the Ranger genocide. You know, it's called unfinished business left by other prior general prior to him. 
uh, General Tan Shui and General Nguyen. So let me briefly discuss about the timeline of Burma path to partial democracy. In 2010, November, Burma, you know, uh, called for uh, election, so-called election using the USDP. This is the USDP. This is the military form civilian party. They want to have influence too. So military, they like to practice colonialism. So they want to benefit their military family. So they want to, in the name of democracy, they form a fake, you know, political party, USDP military, which is influenced by the military. So for the first time in 20 years, they hold the election for themselves and they claim the power for themselves. And at the time, they did not give NLD. This is the National League Democracy, led by Aung San Suu Kyi. I'm sure many of you know her. He was a Nobel Peace Prize winner. But unfortunately, you know, we lost trust on her. You know, and then she, you know, he, he couldn't constat that he couldn't consess that time, couldn't take part in the election because the USDP, they hold the election themselves. You know, a week after the military victory, USDP victory, Aung San Suu Kyi finally was released from house arrest after more than a decade. Then on 2011, you know, the USDP announced they're going to give some kind of partial democracy and then they want to give NLD to rejoin the political process. However, during that time, we Rohingya minority have suffered in the name of democracy, in the name of fake democracy given by the military USDP. Islamophobia started in Rohingya. So the military is using the old tactics of, you know, dividing the people, you know, since in 1962 policy, divide and conquer. So they make up fake claims that Rohingya is trying to be an Islamic extremist, trying to be a terrorist. So this is all fake claim. You know, we Rohingya have been living peacefully more than since 12th century. We have so many of our cabinet members who have contributed to Burma. You know, there's so many doctors, engineers, businessmen in Burma that has contributed to the Burma economy. So they, they make up this fake, you know, Islamophobia, which they follow the Western, you know, how Islamophobia in the Western world you know, to, you know, saying that Islam is cause of the terrorism, you know, they make up fake propaganda, they make up a group called 969 movement, it's a, a Buddhist right-wing nationalist movement, it's equivalent to the white KKK, how the white KKK, you know, they are trying to dominate the white power, same thing in Burma, they're trying to dominate the Burmanism, Burmanism is the majority of Burmese race, you know, Buddhist first, you know, they're using in the name of Buddhist, you know, to claim you know, most Buddhists, you know, Buddhism is, is a very peaceful religion. Unfortunately, even the Dalai Lama conducted Burma and they say that Burma is not a true Buddhist, Buddhist country. So the military, you know, the, have the divide and conquer policy and they withdraw all the privileges from uh, voting rights from Rohingya. We Rohingya was uh, dis disfranchised by the Burmese uh, Punta Gavon. So let me come with the timeline. In 2015, finally, Aung San Suu Kyi had the opportunity to stand for election. After, after more than 50 years, you know, Burma have somewhat, elect, uh, somewhat fair election with the opposition party NLD. And Aung San Suu Kyi won the election in a, uh, in a victory. So they form a new government after 50 years of military domination. Then as soon as uh, Aung San Suu Kyi took power, how unfortunate, how ironic, in the name of democracy, you know, the military junta, along with the Buddhist extremists and you know the Burmese extremists, they committed genocide on the Rohingya in a Rakhine state. Again, they make a fake story, you know, saying that Rohingya is a terror, is a, they are terrorists, they are threat to Burma, you know, they are Muslim, you know, they're using all religious extremists. So they're trying to fool the Burmese people. Unfortunately, the Burmese people got fooled. The majority of Burmese people are Buddhist, you know, and other, you know, minority, they got fooled by that, saying that, you know, oh, you know, this is not an ethnic crisis. You know, they are, you know, they even call us illegal immigrants from Bangladesh, which is not true. We are not illegal immigrants from Bangladesh. We have, you know, existence in our, our current state. There's so many history, so many, you know, proven, you know, heritage site, you know, mosques, buildings, even a radio station at the time when Burma was, you know, under the military control, you know, that, that time they, uh, they recognize us. Uh, how come all of a sudden in, in today's age, they are not recognizing Rohingya? It's simple because they want to commit genocide and they don't recognize minority. The United Nations has even uh, said, you know, it's a genocide. 
and it's an ethnic cleansing, and they, they have set up an investigation, you know, all the human rights abuses by, not only by the army, also by the racist extremist group known as 969, and all the major, majority Rakhine extremist group, similar to KKK, you know, they try to, you know, uh, wipe up the Rohingya from Burma. In 2018, Finally, the UN, you know, thanks to the advocacy of all over the global uh, global human rights movement, Rohingya is recognized, you know, uh, by the world and also by United Nations. And then in 2018, we have filed a lawsuit, you know, with the help of UN and all the United States, you know, to ICC, known as International Criminal Court, because we want, we need justice for so many thousands, thousands of Rohingya has been, you know, butchered and killed alive and babies as young as two years old, one year old has been burned alive and women are raped. So we are asking for justice. So we follow justice. And, you know, on 2018, uh, ICG accepted our case and Aung San Suu Kyi, you know, which was a leader at the time, you know, he failed to prevent the violence. You know, she, you know, something what wonder means that, you know, she, she won the Nobel Peace Prize, but he refused to acknowledge the Rohingya issue and even let alone mention the name, he's saying it's a communal violence, it's a racial tension. It's not a racial tension, it's a genocide, 100% genocide. And finally, in December 2019, the genocide lawsuit against Burma military by United Nations and International Criminal Court, Justice Court. The ICJ held a public hearing in the Netherlands Hawk on December 2019, which is recently, about a couple of years ago. Aung San Suu Kyi, openly came, you know, defended the military, the same military that, you know, released her on the house arrest, run, unfortunately put her back on house arrest. And she not only that, he awarded, awarded using the word Rohingya, and he said that, oh, the military did not uh, commit any genocide. You know, this was just a, you know, uh, communal violence, you know, racial tension, you know, he just make up some story. You know, and unfortunately, the same military, they lock her up, he defending the military. So finally, on 23 January 2020, the ICJ right away you know, requested a provisional measure. A provisional measure means that you know, Rohingya must be protected right away. We, we have to be prevented for gen future genocide act and also hold Burma junta military government accountable and those uh, collaborators accountable. So you know, then we are still going on there. You know, we're supposed to have a follow up you know, meeting and whole, you know, like a trial for Ming Online. But unfortunately, the Ming Online, the, the current dictator of Burma, he's hiding, he, in the name of democracy, he again uh, did a military coup. Then, uh, then last year, 2020, November election, NLD, uh, again, election will held again after five years. So NLD won line slight, you know, so it, that's not surprising because the majority of Burmese people only know Aung San Suu Kyi, only know NLD because of, like I mentioned early on, Burma have a, you know, a relationship with the military government. Say so that's the only party that can contest. So, of course, that's the only choice they can vote for. But unfortunately, many of the minority leaders, minority community in Burma don't recognize her, not just we Rohingya, because she, she failed to protect them in the Shen conflict, Shen, Shen Karen, Kachin, those are attending minority Christian and also Buddhists, you know, like a Shan Buddhist, they doesn't speak for her because she, she never, uh, you know, protected them while the military was uh, committing genocide. So when uh, Aung San Suu Kyi won the defector later, so then right away, as soon as the election result was announced, military junta Ming Online accused NLD of election fraud. And he's saying that, you know, because they lost so many seats, you know, so the military right away, they did a coup February right away on the February 1st, military has been controlling Burma since now. It's been almost uh, one month now, one month plus, getting close to one month now. So that the military is, uh, had been under coup. And Ming Online said that, you know, there's the general dictator, that he will take over Burma for one year until fair election. Because the purpose of this, I'm going to explain also why they did the coup. Okay, uh, let me just explain. These are the mastermind of the Rohingya genocide and all the ethnic minorities. Prior to them, bear in mind, some of them already date 
or some of them already are hiding in Nepido. Like Newing, he was one of the, you know, the founder of, you know, the genocide. You know, he is the one that came up with a operation called Dragon Operation to target particularly the Rohingya and ethnic minority. During that operation, more than, you know, thousands, hundred thousands, or over half a million Rohingya, we have to flee to Bangladesh, we have to flee all over to neighboring countries. And then also so many of thousand, thousand people have lost lives. And then followed by him was Salmon. You know, they did so many coup. So the, also bear in mind, Burma military did coup many times in the name of democracy. So the second coup was by Salmon. He was one of the, of the dictator and genocide. Then Tang Shui, you know, he's currently still alive. He's the one also, the mastermind of genocide. And followed by Mong A, then King Yu. All those are general. Then this Cheng Sing, he was briefly a president uh, for Burma from 2011 to 2016. He was a military dictator, but in the name of democracy, he removed his military clothes to act like a president to commit genocide. Then the current dictator is uh, Ming Online, who is the mastermind of the genocide and also the coup, the coup, who like, you know, the leader of the coup. So he's the one that planning everything because he wants to protect the military interests. All the instruction was given by a prior leader. So like I mentioned earlier, on, it's a big, big, huge mistake for Aung San Suu Kyi to accept the military junta in the democracy government. You know, there's a saying, you know, when someone given a power, absolute power corrupt people. Unfortunately, Aung San Suu Kyi was given the power after so many years under house arrest. As soon as he, he saw her power, he realized he's not an activist anymore. He's not a community leader anymore. He's more like a typical politic leader, greedy for power and foreign wealth. There's a power clash between the NLD and the military junta, which, you know, Aung San Suu Kyi agreed to give the military 25% seat without any election. So that's why, you know, you know, they are doing uh, all this, you know, uh, coup. So Aung San Suu Kyi know very well what's going on with the military, but at the time when she had the opportunity to spoke out, she refused to spoke out. You know, he was siding with the military with so many war crimes, not just on Rohingya, on also other ethnic minorities. And he give uh, the military a free waiver pass to get away with so many crimes and also corruption. Okay, let me explain why why the military uh, did a coup in Burma. The first reason is the military want to, you know, retain its supreme power of the people and the government because it want to remain the dictator and want to control the people movement. And just at the same time, they also want to enjoy democracy wealth. You know, democracy, when you, when you open up a country, other countries will, will like to come in like the US, the EU, Japan, they would like to invest. So they want the money too. At the same time, they want to control people's brain in the name of democracy. So colonialism, colonialism is a big team. You know, they want to protect their generation wealth for the military families. You know, so many of the military families, they are protected by China and also ASEAN. Singapore is one of the biggest investors and also most of the military families are hiding in Singapore, their wealth. You know, they have so much money and the Singapore banks let them store the money freely there because of course Singapore is a, you know, they want to benefit the country also. They want money from the genocide victim. Another reason is uh, they want to escape from the international trial and prosecution by ICC war, crime, war crimes against genocide and Rohingya. Because once the military con control the country, they can do whatever they want. They can be hide from the international government. They cannot be arrested because UN doesn't really have that pressure yet to go after a country like a, a, a dictator yet. And also they want to establish more military junta own enterprise. You know, that, that, that's also, also very dangerous because like I mentioned, you know, most of the businesses in Burma, more than half of the business in Burma are controlled by military junta uh, called uh, MEHL, Myanmar Economics Holding Limited, is controlled by Ming Online and also their family, crony families. It's all about them, you know, they won't care about other public. So for them, any money they get, whether it's a blood money, whether how they get it illegal, they will keep the money to themselves. Unfortunately, you know, because of strong support on China and Russia, veto power, veto power, whenever UN condemn 
you know, call for investigation. China and Russia are the first country to call for veto power. So they're using that, you know, advantage, you know, you know, Burma is taking the advantage of China and Russia. That's why Burma, they are not afraid of Western sanction or US or any other country because China will protect them at all costs. And like I mentioned, China Belt and Road Initiative, what I mean by that, China has a goal, you know, to, I believe one of the goal is to have an economic interest in 70 countries in all over Asia and all over the world. And one of the countries is Burma. So China is definitely taking advantage of this situation as well. You know, they're in the name of economy, they're protecting, you know, Burma, you know, whatever they say, you know, the military is, uh, they call it a cabinet clash, but China doesn't even call it as a military coup because obviously they want to protect their economy interests. You know, China also have a big interest in the Burma West, Western state, Rakhine state, where the Rohingya minorities are living there, majority of them, they build an illegal gas pipeline with the support of the military uh, uh, government. Because of that, we Rohingya have to flee to neighboring Bangladesh, you know, the, the military committed genocide. You know, the China is, you know, is one of the dead thing. And they, they know what's going on, obviously. You know, when we approach China so many times, China keep on saying that this is an internal matter, you know, we cannot interfere. So we get a, like a, ge a generic answer. And same thing for Russia too. Russia also and China, they're one of the world key player for the economy and they are against democracy. You know, they're also all communist CCP principle. So they don't really, you know, first of all, those two countries, they're not even Democrat. So they don't know the value of democracy. They don't know the value of giving freedom to people. So whenever other neighboring country commit genocide, all they issue a statement say, oh, it's just internal matters. It's not our it's not our business we want uh we we want to protect our economy interests and also asean asean known as association southeast asian nation country it was unfortunately was formed for greed for economy interests asean has a strong non-interference policy whenever you know the un and the u.s government try to you know tell asean to boycott burma they say you know what we cannot interfere in Burma, you know, this is not our business, you know, we have to protect our economy interests. So ASEAN, you know, they are not doing their job of, you know, they claim to, you know, protect human rights and, you know, uh, accept everyone. But unfortunately, you know, they are saying that, you know, oh, no, we don't, we, this, we, we cannot really interfere, you know, so we have to kind of, you know. So, and then Burmanism, like I mentioned, you know, uh, Bur Burmanism is they want to protect the Buddhist first, you know, Burmanism, the Burmese race, is the first, you know, and they, they're trying to protect themselves. And, you know, they want to kind of like KKK, I mentioned like white nationalists, right wing, same thing they're doing in Burma. And then I'm, I'll be almost done. Uh, give me about five minutes. So let me just briefly discuss what's going on. What is next now that the coup has take place and what is the crisis for the Rohingya and people of Burma? So the obviously we Rohingya are against this military junta because we have been a victim of this uh, military for more than a decade since my great great grandfather time you know we have suffered a lot you know so we are of course against the junta and we want real democracy in burma not fake democracy using nld and other political group we want all minority uh, minor, minorities to be represented in burma not just majority burmanism so let me just go briefly what is the recent plan bangladesh you know we cannot depend on bangladesh currently most of the Rohingya refugees are living in bangladesh remote island, you know, because Bangladesh is also one of the poorest country in the world too. We cannot really depend on them too. Unfortunately, it's our neighboring country from Arkan. So we have to flee there. So they are currently, they, are, they plan to move three to 4,000 Rohingya refugees there. And also uh, some of them staying in Bangladesh refugee camp. And then of course, we want to voluntarily uh, rare operation the Rohingya refugee, ensure all the safety and rights, you know, means that, you know, we don't want to be a victim of genocide again. And we want Burma government to close down IDP camp, internal displaced camp in Rakhine state and ensure safe return of all Rohingya to the original home Rakhine state and establish safekeeping zone. We want safekeeping zone, this, this is very important because you know history have taught us the genocide in Rwanda, Bosnia, and also currently the Uyghur genocide. So we want to make sure there's a UN peacekeeping fund because we cannot believe the military. Military has been lying to the world for more than decades, more than 50 years. And never again, we cannot keep on saying never again, never again, we have to, you know, hold the military accountable. We have to hold them accountable, we have to put them in the, in the criminal court 
and jail them, you know, if possible, all the collaborators. And also importantly for the people of Burma, we want to let you know we Rohingya indigenous minority, we stand with the uh, we stand with all the CDM movement, civil disorder movement, and we want the Burmese people to ask to establish intern, internal government, not just depend on NLD, because don't be blinded by NLD. NLD is not going to save you. NLD is already, you, you, as you can see, NLD agreed to the 2008 constitution. You know, they did not, you know, and they were siding with the military. Aung San Suu Kyi was happily having tea with the Ming, General Ming online. So, you know, don't depend on NLD. Ask for a, a new government, you know, with the help of the international community. You know, we need also, you know, Taiwan help because Taiwan is a democracy form uh, from after, you know, they came from China. So we need similar government in Burma to not just depend on NLD. And lastly, we want to restore all the Rohingya bona fide citizen rights and all the and all the discrimination, you know, for Rohingya and repression policy and all ethnic minorities and give us back all our rights. You know, these are the rights that we have. We want to be a citizen and we want to assimilate in Burma. We have contributed to Burma so many things, like I mentioned, there's so many cabinet members, so many, you know, doctors, engineers, and you know, businessmen that have contributed to Burma economy. And unfortunately. They're calling us illegal immigrants. You know, this, this is this is a very sad history. So I'll be done two uh, two more minutes, and then let me see. Um, let me show you just some pictures. These are some of the pictures. You know that you know the Rohingya minority suffer. The women and children are not spare. You know they are taken as a slave labor, sex labor, and these kids, this young kid was taken as a slave labor. Unfortunately, in Rakhine State. I'm sorry for the picture. This is the mass killing. This is the picture is verified by Rudas. Rudas, you know, um, they say they sent us this picture. This is they kill the mass killing by the military junta. These are they laid them up. This is a young Rohingya man. Then, as you can see on the right, these are the body. You know, they they chop off their head brutally. You can see. I'm sorry for the gruesome picture, but this is what I have to show the world. And let me. And this is what the Rohingya government. Uh, this is what the Myanmar government is doing. Burmese government. They are doing malnutrition. This is slow genocide by not giving food and anything, by you know not uh, letting them suffer in the IDP camps. And this is the current coup that is going on. We stand with Burma, all the you know the uh, civil societies. You know this happened actually yesterday. Unfortunately, there's more than ten deaths. This young man, he just died just for protesting. Military shot him openly, broadly. A young pregnant lady. A teacher just died just for pro protesting and a young kid got shot daylight and also a young man got shot just for protesting and let me share this video real quick uh, i hope everyone can see the video it's only two minutes video <laughs> So this happened a couple of days ago. We got the video from one of our correspondents in Burma. You know, they were running away from the military. The military was not using rubber bullets, bear in mind. They are using real life guns to shoot protesters. Anyone is there, they will just shoot them. Of course, they shoot in the air, they, they shoot in the air first, then followed by, they will shoot straight. So military will shoot anybody, so they don't really uh, discriminate. This is what I mean by crackdown by the Burmese Punjab. As you can see, the police are surrounding the city, and this is in Yangon. And currently, uh, they have arrested more than 500 um, Burmese uh, citizens in Yangon just for protesting. Okay, let me go to the next slide. Okay, I'm going to end with a quote. Then I, that, that will conclude my presentation. This is a, a quote from a Martin Newell, a, a German pastor who was part of the Hitler, but he opposed the Nazi regime. First, they came for the Rohingya. 
and they did not spoke, speak out because they are not Rohingya. Then they came for the Shan, Kayan, and Etan ethnic minorities. Then they came for the Muslims in Yangon and Mandalay, and they did not speak out because they are not Muslims or minorities. Then they came for the people of Myanmar, and there's no one left to speak for them. So basically, to summarize, this quote means that in the beginning, when Rohingya was facing genocide, majority of Burmese people, they did not side with the Rohingya. They call us illegal immigrants. They say this is not a genocide. They say we make a fake story. We're trying to get a separate land from Burma, which is absolutely false. We were trying to be a free human being, just like anyone in this world, enjoy you know, freedom of movement, enjoy voting rights, enjoy to live in Burma. But unfortunately, they did not speak for us. So that's why the military right now, they're going after democracy. So I hope moving forward, we all can learn, the world can learn, is to speak out for everybody, not just Rohingya, don't have to be Rohingya. Today could be Rohingya, tomorrow, tomorrow could be uh, somewhere in Africa or somewhere in our neighboring countries. You know, we all have to, we all as a human being, have a collective you know, responsibility to speak up for our fellow human beings. So I urge all the Burmese people to come forward and everyone to come forward. We will support you and just support all the minorities in the world. And I will take any questions. And if, if you have any, if you need more information, you can email me at larohingya at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Neng. Please welcome our next presenter, Mr. Simon Billings, Executive Director of International Campaign for the Rohingya, who will also be speaking on Rohingya. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Koko Yang, for that uh, amazing and uh, powerful presentation. Uh, and what I'm going to do is quite simply uh, explain how people can stand up for the Rohingya, can stand up for democracy in Myanmar, and how we can take action, whether we live in the United States or whether we live anywhere else in the world. Because this is a, a struggle right now with this current military coup. It's a struggle between a brutal and corrupt military hunter and it's a struggle with the people of the country, the people of Myanmar who are on the streets right now. And not just ethnic Burmans in Mandalay and Rangoon, we're seeing young people of all ethnicities in Burma on the streets opposing this military coup, calling for the international community to put tough and targeted sanctions on the Myanmar military and on their extensive business interests. And this is how we can stand with the Rohingya. This is how we can stand with other ethnic minorities like the Karen and the Kachin and the Shan in Burma. This is how we can stand with these brave young people from the ethnic Burman majority who are on the streets right now, putting their bodies on the line against the guns, and 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 uh, uh, the guns and the, and the and the bully sticks of the uh, Myanmar military and the Myanmar police. We, just as we have to stand with the brave people of the Hong Kong democracy movement, just like we have to stand with the Uyghurs, just like we have to stand with um, uh, the Taiwanese for their uh, uh, democracy and their human rights, we must stand. For the rights of everyone and we can do that very simply uh, in a number of ways i've put into the chat box a uh, link to our uh and i'm going to put it in there again there is a link to our petition to president biden asking him to to uh impose the 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 tough and targeted sanctions on the Myanmar military that the people of Myanmar are asking us for. During the campaign against apartheid in South Africa, the people of South Africa called on the international community 
to put tough economic sanctions on the South African apartheid regime. And we honored that call. Those of us, many of us were active in the campaign against apartheid in South Africa, and we put pressure on our governments to sanction the apartheid regime. We put pressure directly on companies to end their doing business with the South African apartheid regime. And we can do the same for Myanmar now, and we can do that today. What I put in the chat box is a link to the petition that you can sign right now. It's a fresh petition asking that uh, President Biden enact and impose tough economic sanctions on the Myanmar military and their business interests. And I'm putting another petition, a petition directly to Facebook to deplatform and ban all Myanmar military and all Myanmar military business accounts from Facebook. Facebook has already banned a number of Myanmar military accounts. After several long years, when the Myanmar military spread hate speech as part of their campaign of genocide against the Rohingya. Just as Facebook, just as Facebook has deplatformed neo Nazis and other hate groups, Facebook must completely deplatform the Myanmar military. And the petition is in the box right there where you can where you can do that. But we also need to cut off the flow of money to the Myanmar military. And um, one of the things that we're doing is that we are asking that people put pressure on the companies that are bankrolling the Myanmar military. The Myanmar military gets millions of dollars from the oil and gas industry. Companies like Chevron of California, companies like Total of France. And we're putting pressure directly on Chevron and putting pressure directly on other companies to stop the flow of the money to the Myanmar military. And again, I have another petition that you can send directly to Chevron. I'm putting that in the chat right now. Please click on that petition and demand that Chevron stop bankrolling the Myanmar military through its, uh, its, uh, its operations in Burma. So there's many things that people can do here. And you know, as we ask and demand our elected officials and our governments to impose sanctions on the Myanmar military, um, you know, in accordance with the call by the civil disobedience movement in Myanmar. I mean, one thing you have to understand is that the, these brave young people on the streets of Myanmar right now, of all ethnicities, there are, there are Rohingya openly marching as Rohingya inside Rangoon and shoulder to shoulder with ethnic Burmans, ethnic Karen, ethnic Kachin. This new generation in Myanmar that's on the streets right now, this Generation Z that's connected uh, so much with the international community, they are the generation that's going to, I believe, uh, uh, oppose and do away with the prejudices of their elders uh, against groups, ethnic minorities like the Rohingya, and, and oppose the Myanmar military as it uses these prejudices and uses these divisions to maintain its rule. The Myanmar military has been very powerful and very effective in dividing and conquer the, the many peoples of Burma by setting people against each other. But this new generation that's on the streets right now sees right through that. They know that the military is just stoking these prejudices to uh, divide and rule and stay in control of the country. They see right through that. And they are, I believe, the generation that will not just end military rule, but bring in uh, a new era of a truly multi-ethnic uh, Myanmar. So again, please go to the chat box. There are three petitions right there to President Biden, to Chevron, and to Facebook. Please take those actions. Uh, when you take those actions, you'll join our email list at the International Campaign for the Rohingya. 
and with no business with genocide. And uh, you'll receive um, regular updates on how you can stand in solidarity with the Myanmar democracy movement and how you can help end the genocide of the Rohingya by the Myanmar military and all the other mass atrocities that the Myanmar military has committed against uh, the many other ethnic minorities in Burma. So I thank you for your time. I thank you for your action. And uh, I really appreciate your solidarity. Thank you, Mr. Villanes. Let's all put pressure on the Miramar military junta. Um, you, you guys see the on the chat, she posted all those links. Uh, we're going to go back to Dr. Nonisa Kerben, and Charles is going to help us uh, with the presentation. Again, I apologize for the technical difficulty. Um, thank you so much for Coco for, for a wonderful presentation. Um, Charles, if you can go to the next slide. Um, just to quickly give you a overall um, context in terms of the, the where the East Turkestan, so-called Xinjiang, the Uyghur Autonomous Region, is located and as you can see it's on uh, northwest of china where yes. um, it borders with uh, mongolia uh, russia kazakhstan kyrgyzstan and tibet and as you can see that it, the the in terms of area it's one sixth of um, whole china territory uh, rich uh, with natural resources and as far as the uh, population goes uh, in 2007 2015 uh, the chinese government said they were uh, on 11 million Uyghurs, but by Uyghur scholars, it's that that number is um, fluctuates uh, between, uh, you know, uh, 20 million, basically. Um, the language is called Uyghur, and it's part of a uh, Turkic language family. That means that I can communicate with uh, Central Asian uh, uh, other ethnic groups, such as Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, Uzbek and Kyrgyz, uh, comfortably, I have to say. And that's, uh, we use a Persian script uh, as well as a Latin Uyghur new script uh, in, our, in, in our language. Next slide. Um, this is the picture that I kind of talk about um, my, my upbringing. I was born and raised in uh, Kashgar city. That's the, uh, one of the uh, famous uh, historical sites and a, a city that holds the uh, Uyghur culture and identity alive, and also it bear witness for the uh, the central the Silk Road history of Silk Road for thousands of years. Um, and then I also have the picture right here on the right corner. That's where the uh, the concentration camps were marked based on the evidence that were collected by the researchers, by the reporters. Um, and as you can see, that most of the a significant number of concentration camps were built around the Kashgar city that I was born and my rest of my family, hopefully they're still alive and, and they, they, they live out there. And you can imagine how heartbroken I am. Next slide. Um, this is my family. Um, uh, this is the picture that I took, uh, the middle one, when I went back to Kashgar 2011 with my girls. Um, and on the right side, that's my mother and my father. Uh, my mother passed away 20 years ago, and that's my sister, and she's my older sister. And the left side, that's my family. Uh, we're gathering at the family dinner, and that's, that's how I grew up. Um, the reason I'm showing this picture is that um, my dad came in 2016 to visit me and stay there for a few months. And um, he wanted to go back. And I said, well, stay. And he said, well, I'll, I'll come back because I have 10-year visit, I mean, 10-year uh, visa. 
um, to the United States so I can go back and come back in, in the spring. Um, so he left um, and two weeks later, he was told to turn in his passport. Um, so the government took away his passport. And later on, I learned that uh, it wasn't just my, my dad and everyone, a millions of Uyghurs, they were ordered to turn in their passports. It didn't really matter if you traveled abroad or you just held a passport. And that was the uh, news that I got. And I have my sister's picture right there because uh, the last time I mentioned, not speak to her, but last time I mentioned my sister was back in 2017 when I tried to reach out to her. She didn't call me. Uh, she didn't pick up my phone. And later my dad contacted my brother who lives in Corona to tell me not to contact her or tell him to just don't call your sister. And that was the last time I barely mentioned my sister's name to my father. Um, since then, I haven't spoken to her, and it's going to be four years um, in coming Monday, and I, I don't know her whereabouts, I don't know where she is, and I hope she is still, um, you know, she is an accountant, and I hope she is still an accountant, and I'm just, I'm, I'm heartbroken not to be able to know where my parents, my uh, relatives' whereabouts. Next. Um, and this is the picture that uh, my, we took when my dad came here. So moving forward, and I was telling about my father, uh, him, uh, the conversation, how the conversation was very limited, how my families and friends, they defriended me through WeChat that you all, you know, the app, and how I was completely um, alienated from my, my family members and friends. And my dad was the only uh, contact point person that we we would be able to talk to him for 30 seconds and we were not allowed to ask any questions or we didn't we were not allowed to ask or mention anybody in our family and i made a peace with that um, i continued what i supposed to do um, i continued to tell my stories and work with my friends uh, like you to raise awareness pass forward um, last march uh, my my brother tried to reach out to him and he didn't reply and he struggled to contact him for two weeks. And after two weeks, he eventually was able to talk to him through landline. And my dad told him that uh, the police came to his house and asked him to turn in his cell phone because he was receiving or talking too many times to uh, with overseas, meaning us. And too many times would be 30 seconds from me, maybe 10 minutes or five minutes from my brother. And that was the conversation that we had very plain, very straightforward. And uh, apparently the police didn't like that. He, they took away his cell phone and told him that they were going to investigate. And eventually he said that they brought his cell phone. But when, when he told my brother that, and he told him to tell your sister, that would be me not to call me again. And that 30 seconds of conversation I, that I was, I was hoping to have, uh, it ended that day. Um, so I didn't speak to him. And um, in May, May 19th, um, I got a news that he passed away. And I didn't know he was sick. I didn't know how he died. And that news traveled through somewhere in different countries. And it took about 20, around 24 to 48 hours to, to let me know that I passed away. Because my family members uh, back home, they were afraid to talk to us and let us know that he passed away. And since then, that was it. And my last connection, he's gone. And um, it just, it just, I, I have no idea about my family and my friends. Um, so my, the story is not just I'm telling you this because it, you can see the progression 
of the Chinese government, how I came about, how this four years of oppression or, or uh, the genocide changed my life for the worst, along with the millions of Uyghurs that were suffering. And this story that you hear, you heard today is not it's not unusual. And we some unfortunately, some of us have to lose a lot. Um, some of us knew that our family members were taken away from us. Some of us knew that our friends were sentenced to long uh, um, jail time. And we, we know the stories of our friends, their family members were forced to, um, forced sterilization, abortion. Um, all the, um, the news that you heard and we 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 are a witness of this, those those evidence that were presented that eventually bring people to the atrocities that were taken place in in East Turkestan and declared genocide. Moving forward. Um, I'm not going to go over at uh, these pictures are were speaks volumes in terms of how the concentration camps, how those people were um, in, incarcerated and the pictures of uh, scholars, academics, writers and musicians that were basically proving the claims of Chinese government um, saying that those concentration camps were not jail. It's, it was just re-education re camps to provide uh, lives of uh, Uyghurs. And as you can see that those people were very well educated and there were, they had skills to, to survive and contribute to the society. And that basically proves that the Chinese government is trying to cover up the mass atrocities that they were uh, committing. Next. And this picture is, it breaks my heart every time I look at it because this is the city that I was, I grew up. This is the city that I spent 18 years of my life. And the picture on the left side, that's what I grew up seeing. A millions of people were praying in front of the uh, world famous mosque called Eidgar Mosque. And, um, and then now, as you can see that there, it, it was completely off limits for people for, um, to enter even. And it was there, you see the heavy police presence there. And on the right side, those that behind that, that um, picture, that the scene, that's the old city of Kashgar. It's very, um, uh, very, very um, famous site. And um, as you can see that every single corner, there, were, there is a police presence with surveillance camera checking everybody's phone. And we were told that they were asked to uh, download the software, software to spy on their conversations, uh, making sure that they hear, they listen, everybody's uh, communication. And that's, that basically uh, made sense to me because of the disappearance of my friends from my network and because of my dad's sudden change of uh, communication and because of the police came to my dad and, and harassed him and took away his cell phone and telling him that it, that that he was talking to us and the street that you see on the right side that's the street that i grew up running around and knocking at, on my my relatives my friend's door and and that street it was just full of people walking and and basically minding their own daily business and as you can see and they're all very empty and apparently it makes sense when you basically calculate how many people were sent to concentration camps and there were no one there and their kids were sent to um, the state run uh, orphanages because their parents were locked up in the concentration camps. And uh, Charles, who talked about how the education system has changed in Hong Kong and how they were taking away that critical thinking uh, curriculum, liberal curriculum away because they want to uh, produce a generation of obedience. And that's how I grew up. And I never had that a sense of critical thinking and questioning because the curriculum that I, I was taught and education that I got was completely, that's what it is. And I learned about um, all the 
critical thinking skills through my education here, through my work at LAVSD, educating thousands of students. And it's just a beautiful, critical, a core value, a core, core um, significance of education. And I, it, my heart aches when I heard that it, that that dilemma is face is going to Hong Kong and basically de destroying the education system in Hong Kong. And uh, as you can see, the assimilation was uh, very, very evident. Um, the kids were not allowed to speak their own language. They're not allowed to, to practice. And they were forced to uh, speak um, hand, uh, uh, Mandarin language and act like uh, Mandarin kids. Um, and they were forbidden to eat um, halal food. And that, that label was taken away from any kind of food label. Um, they were forced to eat pork, and that's what they were doing. They're basically uh, doing a social engineering to expedite the process of assimilation. Next. And, you know, um, I'm very, um, I believe in love. I believe in free will, and um, everybody has a right to marry whoever they want. And that's that's my beliefs, and unfortunately, when it was taken away from you and you were forced to marry someone that you don't know and for the purpose of um, assimilation and you become a propaganda tool, you become a tool of the Chinese government and that's heartbreaking. And that's what exactly is happening for Uyghur girls that were forced to marry. And um, and it's it's just, it's, it's I, I can't even, imagine how their parents and how those girls are going through because I have two girls and I came here to make sure that they have a better life and I have two girls and I cannot imagine as a mother to go through my daughters with that pain and um and another thing that really disgusted everyone was the um was the um the government officials are, are order to live with the Uyghur families um, and, and spy on them. And, and the thing is that their, their husbands were sent to concentration camps or they're in jail. And that was one of the um, <laughs> strategies that they used. Moving forward. Um, the, well, this is basically the, the um, strong evidence of how the Chinese government is trying to eradicate Uyghurs, not only by attacking their, their religious beliefs, but their, also their cultural beliefs, their identity, by um, basically eliminating and attacking the scholars that they, they, were, they were the essence of the Uyghur identity. Next. Um, Again, another evidence of how the Chinese government is committing genocide. Um, those are a very, very popular academic scholars. Uh, Professor Tashblad Teep was the president of the university that I graduated, um, and um, very highly educated, ed educated scholar, along with um, Halmrad Gopur. He was also a very well-known professor and head of the medical university, and they were sentenced to death and nothing has changed and and I I don't know their fates and Ilham Tohti obviously um, um, a, lot, a lot of you know his work and he's also sentenced to life in imprisonment and his daughter Jafar is working very hard along with other organizations to to raise awareness and advocating for, not only for him for Uyghurs um, altogether. Next. Um, this is the, the the latest horrific news that came out uh, towards tonight. And, and well, previous camp, concentration camp survivors were telling and testifying in terms of how brutal uh, the Chinese government was in terms of um, the torture and the rape and sterilization um, and all around this the heinous crime in concentration camps. And this was a deal breaker. Um, Tursunai eventually came off and the first, uh, her 
her interview was aired in on BBC, and um, I just I just saw the 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 title and I didn't really watch the video. I didn't really read it for for a long time, and it took me a long time to really calm myself down and and watch the video and read. And it just it's just horrific. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you. And again, this is the uh, this this is what we were trying to tell the world, try to raise awareness. And eventually, um, last year, the um, the China the massive uh, protocol um, confidential like our, our file was leaked, and uh, New York Times actually released that, and that was a um, I think that was like four hundred a page documentation that was uh, developed by the central government directing um, how to run uh, the concentration camps. And when it came out, and uh, I don't think the Chinese government had anything to say to deny it, and that basically confirmed the testimonies, the evidence that we were trying to present to the world. Next. And this, uh, these are um, two of the concentration camp survivors were testifying in front of Congress and telling their stories. Move forward. Next. Um, as you know, it's the Charles mentioned how in Chinese government is 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 in terms of uh, harassing uh, the people in diaspora, um, trying to uh, in basically intimidate them and, and block their uh, way. And um, these activists also are, are victims of Chinese intimidation in, in any way possible. For example, Rushen Abbas, she's the uh, prominent um, activist. Um, after she spoke uh, back in 2018, her sister was um, taken away. And recently she learned that her sister, she was a retired medical doctor, was sentenced to a long year, I think that was like 14 years in prison. And just because of her activism. And Joe Cat on the right side, and he's still trying to figure out where his mom is because his mom was sent to a concentration camps in and out and she was very ill and if you are if you are an avid listener of podcast, I strongly encourage you to search his name on New York Times daily, and you will hear a two hour of long uh, interview and whole story about his mom and himself as well. Moving forward. Um, and the, here's the heartbreaking part. Uh, besides the fact that China is committing a genocide and 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 transferring those uh, victims of concentration camps, over 800,000 of them, to a factories in other, other uh, provinces of China that were somehow connected to uh, those major uh, companies uh, as Nike and Coca-Cola and Apple. They're they're lobbying against that bill that I was gonna I, I'm gonna mention it later on called uh, Uyghur uh, Forced Uyghur Labor Prevention Act, and that law was introduced um, last year, both in Senate and Congress. And we were told that those companies were spending a lot of money um, again, lobbying against the bill. And if you Google for Uyghur forced labor, and you'll easily find those companies and how they are connected to Uyghur forced labor. Next. Um, and we mentioned about uh, China as being part of Uyghur Human Rights, I mean, uh, UN Human Rights Council. Um, uh, it's heartbreaking that they are in that Council, besides the fact that the whole world is witnessing the genocide that they're committing and their their dirty uh, involvement in in 
in Burma and other places. And it, it was a slap in the face uh, when, when I heard the news that the China was <laughs> elected as a part of Human Rights Council. And I, that's my father. Um, when he was in New York, I remember he wasn't really interested in seeing anything, but there were two things that he wanted to see. And one of them was uh, the UN, UN building. And he wanted to see uh, UN because he was very fond of them and followed everybody, all the past presidents, and he knew the story in and out. And and it just him, um, the this this organization that like people like my father looked up to uh, to it as as a as a as um basically protector, um, yet. You see, that was irony. Next. Um, so I mentioned a little bit in the beginning the progress that uh, we have made. Um, we means everybody, really. The, whoever is involved, everybody involved after three years of hard work. And those are the uh, progress that we made uh, in terms of uh, how the international community is started to pay attention. And there are a lot of organizations that are taking initiative in terms of raising awareness, in terms of uh, making sure that their government recognize atrocities as genocide. Um, I mentioned United States uh, back in last month, actually, and uh, followed by the, our Biden um, administration also recognized and they re reiterated that they would they will stand by the uh, the decision of previous government and the Canada Parliament also um, accepted the motion to accept uh, the the Chinese oppressive treatment as uh, genocide. And last week, the Dutch government also acknowledged its genocide. Um, and the Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act re was reintroduced because it didn't. Um, meet the deadline. So it was reintroduced in the Senate. And I believe it was also reintroduced in Congress. And that's something that we really, really want everybody to, to get involved and call your Congress, call your uh, representative to, um, to make sure that they pass that law, pass that bill and, and, and put pressure on, on those companies in the United States that knowingly being complicit in, in genocide, and we cannot have that have make it happen. Um, next, so this is we have done in terms of raising awareness, um, and uh, Hong Kong Forum and um, uh, FAPA and with the representatives friends here, they were they were there when we needed them. And I, I thank from bottom of my heart for your support. And uh, we will continue to uh, collaborate, continue to work and uh, stand side by side to make sure that our, our people's voice doesn't, doesn't um, disappear. Next. Um, so those are recommendation option uh, the action items that a lot of organizations are working on right now um, obviously educating and raising awareness is number one and even though we have a quite a, a few um, people they now know know enough to acknowledge and dis determine to take actions we still have a lot of work to do in terms of bringing more um, people to our side Another thing that a lot of organizations were pushing for is the Winter Olympics that was scheduled in Beijing in 2022. Um, so they're pressuring their government, including the United States government, to boycott the Winter Olympics because it, besides the, the outrage, besides the, um, the action that the international community is taking, but we haven't seen any change in terms of from the Chinese government. The concentration camps are still there. Millions of people were still missing um, and the genocide is still taking place. So I think it's very, very important for 
our international communities to stay strong and 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 pressure our unite our government, uh, international organizations, uh, and and to really lobby and to make sure that we hold the Chinese government accountable. Um, obviously, the U.S. companies engaged in business in China. That's also a, a huge um, step that we have to take and something that we can do. And there are, um, uh, so those are the recommendations. And really, I really don't know in what capacity you can help, but I'm just here to uh, inform you in terms of what is happening. And those are the recommendations that you can definitely take it back to your organization if you work for organization. If you have a capacity to raise awareness, uh, you can do that. And nothing is small or big when it comes to stand up for justice. And with that, I'm going to conclude my presentation. Thank you so much for having me again. Thank you for opening up for your heartfelt personal story to us, Dr. Corbin. Uh, last but not least, please welcome Mr. Enrique Sanchez. Enrique Sanchez is the director and founder of Spanish United. Uh, he's here to tell us about his organization and Puerto Rico. You may unmute yourself. Thank you. Hello, good afternoon. Are you able to, to hear me? Loud and clear. Perfect. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Enrique Sanchez. I am the founder and director of Spanish United. We are a, a Hispanic civil rights movement that started in June of 2020. And I started the movement after the murder and death of Andres Garado, who was a 17-year-old um, Hispanic uh, security guard in Gardena who was murdered by police. And one of the reasons why I started this movement is because there is a lot of Hispanophobia happening in our country right now. And Hispanics represent the largest um, community in, in, the, in the United States. But at the same time, we are the most unrepresented, meaning that we lack both the political power and the economic power. And in the face of uh, so much um, discrimination against Hispanic people in America, I felt that I need to uh, stake, take a stand. And that's the reason why I started this, this movement. And I'm also representing uh, the people of Puerto Rico. I'm not sure if people know Puerto Rico is a U.S. territory. We've been occupied by, by the United States uh, government since 1898. Even though we are U.S. citizens by default, uh, we are seen as um, second-class citizens, and we don't have equality under under the American system. So I am here to talk about um, the concerns right now happening with the Hispanic community in the United States. There is a lot of uh, Hispanophobia, a lot of racism, discrimination, a lot of Hispanics get abused, exploited by different um, companies, employers, by individuals, and um, I don't see anyone um, fighting for them. And uh, one of my goals of my movement is to make lobbying to make changes in the law so that way Hispanics get minority protection, which currently we don't have, and at the same time uh, make uh, changes in the law so that way we are better represented you know in order in order for his, the hispanic community to have um equality within the united states there needs to be there needs to be reforms and what i mean by reforms is that we need to have economic social and political justice when there are when there are those reforms we're going to be having uh reforms when it comes to the economy to education and to social justice and also another thing that I also want to talk about is the issue of uh, Puerto Rico. Uh, right now, Puerto Rico is going through a very difficult situation since the uh, since the economy has gone down since 2016, when Hurricane when Hurricane Maria um, came to Puerto Rico, it just completely it just completely destroyed the economy, just bankrupt the the economy. 
And there's still many people in Puerto Rico that don't have electricity, that don't have running water. And we are a U.S. territory. People would assume Puerto Rico being a U.S. territory that we, we, we will be getting things overnight. Because of the Jones Act, which was a bill that was enacted in 1917 that puts uh, America first before Puerto Rico first, many different types of uh, aid that were trying to go to the island from Spain and from other countries could not dock in Puerto Rico. They had to go to in a port in Miami first and then go to Puerto Rico. So it took longer for supplies to get to the island. And at the same time, uh, the Puerto Rican government has been very corrupted. So that was an, another issue with um, the inefficiency of, um, of supplies getting getting to where it needed to be. And uh, right now, um, with uh, the current situation of uh, Puerto Rico, uh, we are still seen as um, second and third class citizens. And because of the previous administration, um, it just really harmed the people of, of, of Puerto Rico. And that is something that I'm trying to bring out because um, Puerto Rico is um, a marginalized society. Same with Puerto Rican Americans that come to the United States. We have been part of the United States in the country since the 1920s. A lot of Puerto Ricans came to uh, work in factories. A lot of uh, Puerto Ricans uh, contributed to the arts, to media, and in different ways. But we are still not recognized, nor are we appreciated for what we are. And in many cases, we're actually treated as illegal immigrants. We're actually treated as uh, a minority group. Even though uh, Puerto Ricans are full-fledged U.S. citizens, we do use the U.S. passport. We do use uh, U.S. currency. And most of the uh, laws that apply in the United States also to apply to, uh, to Puerto Rico. The only difference is, is that Puerto Ricans cannot vote for uh, president while they're on the island. They have to move from the island to the mainland in order to vote in presidential election. Puerto Ricans can only uh, vote in primary elections. Um, another thing is that uh, Puerto Rico has been um, voting for many different uh, years, different plebiscites, either to vote on statehood or, or vote for the Commonwealth, which is the current status today. And then there is um, a good amount of people that want in the independence. And what people don't realize is that it doesn't matter if people vote for statehood or the Commonwealth status or independence. Since Puerto Rico is not a incorporated territory of the United States, the one that makes the final decision is Washington, which is the, the Senate. Not even the president can make that decision. You know, not too many people know that. So Puerto Rico's status with uh, the United States is a status of une inequality. Also, uh, the, the tax laws that we have on the island actually permit very wealthy Americans uh, going to the island and establishing businesses, but they don't pay taxes. So the local government and the people do not benefit. And what's going on is that the United States government for the last 50 or 60 years has used Puerto Rico as a social experiment. They have used Puerto, they have used Puerto Rico to use vaccines, sterilization, and at the same time, uh, they have tried to do a cultural genocide against Puerto Ricans by trying to remove the Spanish language as the official language and replace it with English. They tried to uh, make forced assimilation of Puerto Ricans into American society. It was illegal up until the establishment of the Commonwealth of 1952 to even display the Puerto Rican flag, which we have right now. Uh, prior Prior to the establishment of um, the, the uh, Free Association State of Puerto Rico, Puerto Rico was basically occupied territory under, under, under military control, meaning that all of the governors prior to 1952 were appointed by, by Washington. And most of the governors that were in Puerto Rico were inefficient. Some of them did a lot of horrible things, like in the Ponce Massacre of March 21st, 1937, where a group of peaceful Puerto Rican protesters 
went um, to protest in front of the Capitol building and the uh, and the governor of that time by the name of Blankton uh, Winstrup, he ordered a, a massacre and a crackdown of those protesters, similar to what happened with the Urba or the 228 massacre that happened with Ken Kai-shek in 1947. And uh, a lot of those people were not um, prosecuted. The governor was not prosecuted. And even, and even to this day, the descendants of those people are waiting to get justice for what happened in uh, March, 20, March 21st of, of 1937. And uh, I also wanted to uh, mention that um, I'm trying right now to bring awareness of what's happening of the plight of the Hispanic people in the uh, United States. Um, Hispanic people are being uh, mistreated, they're being abused, exploited, and uh, I'm trying to um, create awareness of what's, what's happening with Hispanic people in the United States. You know, and that involves all Hispanic groups from all over Latin America. And uh, it is something of a great concern that uh, the previous administration spewed so much hatred and xenophobia towards um, Hispanic people that right now many Hispanic people in many places or many states are afraid to um, go out because uh, many Hispanics have been either been killed or harassed. They have, they have been racially profiled by the police, you know, asking them for their papers, you know, very similar to what's happening um, in, in Burma with the Rohingya people, with uh, the Uyghurs and in Xinjiang province of China, it's no different. Differences that you don't you don't uh, hear about it. I also wanted to present some, of, some pictures and slideshows of, uh, of going on with uh, Puerto Rico, and at the same time, I'll, I will be presenting some information from Spanish Spanish United. Just give me one second here. Let's see. Yeah, what you're seeing here is the campaign that uh, the United States government uh, did in back in the 1950s, where they tried to um, change the language of uh, Spanish to uh, to English, and there was a big fight uh, between the Puerto Rican government and the U.S. government uh, not to make English the official language because that's how you eliminate a culture is by forbidding their language, forbidding their customs, and and uh, and replacing it with the language of the of the occupying power. Uh, and I also wanted to present uh, another timeline here. Um, This is the Jones Act. The Jones Act was enacted in Puerto Rico in, uh, on March 2nd, 1917, which gives the United States government and the merchant marine industry on the island complete uh, monopoly over Puerto Rico. So that makes um, goods in Puerto Rico much more expensive, and it restricts Puerto Rico from doing trade with other countries. So let's say, for example, if Puerto Rico wants to import bananas from Dominican Republic, uh, Dominican Republic cannot go directly to the island. They would have to go directly to Miami and then from Miami to go to Puerto Rico. And that makes it much more expensive. And there is also another um, law that's called um, Act 2020 or a Ley uh, 20, which gives complete tax um, uh, breaks to wealthy companies and corporations. So a lot of wealthy Americans can go to Puerto Rico, uh, claim their residence on the island, but at the same time live somewhere else. So that does not benefit the people nor the economy. So what that's doing is it's causing a gentrification 
of Puerto Rico, like where I used to live in a little town called Rincon, Puerto Rico, back in 2002, uh, about 70, 80% of that town is composed of white Americans. And they're mostly, uh, you know, wealthy people, business people that have gone there. And what they have done is that um, they have taken over all of the best um, parts of the town the beach towns and the beach town the businesses and whatever. And what I've noticed is that the majority of these white Americans have been living there for 30, 50 years. Not one of them speaks Spanish. They do not associate with the local people. They treat, they treat the local people like if, like if they were servants or slaves. And this is, and this is in Puerto Rico where these white Americans are actually mistreating the people that are on the island. Know, and a lot of people are very upset at it because it's like a lot of Puerto Ricans are being forced to leave the island to go to the states because you know the cost of living has gone too high. You know the federal the federal minimum wage applies to Puerto Rico, but because of the high standard of living and inflation, people are not able to make it. So that's causing a mass exodus of Puerto Ricans to the mainland, and then a lot of wealthy white Americans are moving in. So similar to what's happening with the Uyghurs and with the Rohingya is that it's creating a form of ethnic cleansing, not by massacring people, but by forcing people out due to gentrification where people can no longer afford to live where they, where they live. And I also wanted to present, give me one second, uh, pictures picture of of what of the aftermath of uh, hurricane maria this this is a house of a person uh somewhere on the island that was completely destroyed by the hurricane and this picture was taken last year the hurricane happened in in 2017 um a lot of people in many parts of the island still have not gotten help from fema they still don't have electricity, they still don't have water, and a lot of people are still homeless. And then there was an earth that happened on the island a couple of years ago, and that just continues to create uh, damages to the, to the economy. And I will present um, another picture here. Give me one second. Um, This this is Andres Gorado, the uh, young man that I spoke about that was uh, murdered by the police. Uh, um, when when this when this murder happened, um, other than the local media, there was no mass protest. There was no media coverage. And um, what's really disturbing is that a lot of people were demonizing this poor boy, like he, if he was some type of a, a, a criminal. He had no criminal record. He was working two jobs. And he was actually going to a medical school to become a doctor. But because of the xenophobia that has been brought on by the previous administration, all Hispanic people, it doesn't matter uh, where they are in life, they're seen as bad people. And that is something I would like to change. I would like to change the image of Hispanic people and Hispanic people are good people, we're hardworking people. We can be doctors and engineers, academics, and we can contribute. And this is one of the things that I'm doing with Spanish United that um, I would like to change the image and the perception of Hispanic people in the United States and also to advocate and lobby for their civil rights and human rights because we are an invisible minority. At the same time, um, I also want to um, advocate for the um, human rights and civil rights on the people of, of, um, of Puerto Rico. Uh, back in, um, in the 1990s, the, the, uh, the UN, the United Nations spoke on the decolonization of of Puerto Rico 
and also to determine the self-determination of, of Puerto Rico. After the Second World War, most of Asia and Africa uh, were decolonized and became independent. Puerto Rico is the last remaining uh, colony left in the world. And uh, Puerto Ricans are trying to fight for their own, for their own determination, for their, their own autonomy. And at the same time, they also want to preserve their language and their culture. Uh, Puerto Rico was occupied for almost 400 years by the Spanish. Under, under the Spanish crown, we did have quality, we did have a representation. Uh, when the Spanish-American War happened in 1898, uh, that autonomy that we had disappeared. And the only reason why we were given U.S. citizenship in 1917 was uh, to draft uh, Puerto, Puerto Rican soldiers into the military because the United States was in a war in World War I. But it was not done on the humanitarian grounds. It was more done as a, as a political mean, you know, because they, need, they needed soldiers. And um, it's very important that the world knows what's going on with uh, Puerto Rico because um, you know, it, it's silent. You know, America um, claims to be a champion on, of human rights and democracy, but they deny a lot of things to Puerto Rico and even to Hispanic people in the United States that have been here for generations. Um, I really hope that with this administration, with President Biden, that um, there can be a lot of good, a lot of uh, benefits. Um, has spoken about addressing uh, the status of Puerto Rico. And um, we also hope to see that um, uh, there are changes with the Hispanic community in the United States. Like one step that he did do, which was something that I applaud for, is that he put a bust of Cesar Chavez in the White House, which never in the history of the United States we ever had a Hispanic figure uh, placed. Um, in the in the in the government office, so which is which is something positive. So, hopefully, with this current administration, um, there will be more awareness of what's going on with the Hispanic population, with the Hispanic people, and at the same time, uh, Puerto Rico will uh, uh, heal from past trauma, and at the same time, uh, Puerto Rico's future and determination will be heard and finally met. Uh, before I close, um, I will share uh, some information. Uh, this is the uh, banner of Spanish United. Here is my email, a number if anyone has any questions about the organization. And let me put in the links for the uh, website. This is the um, website of Spanish of Spanish United, um, and a, here is also a petition. And this petition is to seek compensation for Hispanic people for atrocities committed by the U.S. government in the last 100, 200 years. So. If anyone is interested in having this signed into law, feel free to sign the petition because it will be sent to uh, Biden and to the current administration, and hopefully this will be uh, passed and made into law. And I thank, um, I thank uh, everyone for joining in. And yes, if anyone is interested in becoming a sponsor, or Spanish United or sending contributions or anything like that, please feel free to uh, message me, email me, uh, send me a message. And I look forward to hearing from everyone soon. Thank you very much for letting me uh, be part of your conference. I thank the people of FAFA and also to the uh, speakers for letting me part of, uh, of your speech. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez for your presentation on the plight of Hispanics in the U.S. and Puerto Rico. This is a part of the event where a few questions will be answered. Uh, we've got an, uh, a question from Anne uh, to all presenters. 
it seems that the new administration continues to ignore the murder of Khashoggi. Isn't this how other murderers, dictators use that as an example of how they can get away with murder? Um, if you could raise hit, uh, raise your hand, you could answer them. If you'd like to answer that question. To any of the presenters. Charles raises his hand. Charles, perfect. Thank you, Charles. Um, um, I think, yes, it, it is regrettable that the Biden administration decided not to sanction MBS, the person himself, uh, while sanctioning everyone um, helping with the murder of Khashoggi. Um, I think in, in the general um, sense of international relations, it might be, in fact, difficult for any country to directly sanction the leader of a particular ju uh, jurisdiction or, or country. However, um, I think by sanctioning people surrounding the person that are that are involved in the atrocities, it also still sends multiple signals. One is to um, disable the people that are helping with the regime. And second is to give a strong signal to anyone in the government that if they are not at the top, but they are participating in any of the atrocities, they will also face consequences. And this would discourage people from joining the regime and thus weakening the government in the long run. Thank you, Charles. Um, next, we have a question from Shipav Privya. Um, how do Rohingya people feel about the military coup? And do Rohingya people feel that the US and the UN can help with Burma's democracy and Rohingya and other ethnic minorities' rights? How can global citizens help, even if Aunt San Suk Q key returns, it doesn't mean that the Rohingya situation will improve, right? Eat. Let me mute, unmute Simon Lin. Yes, thank you for that question. Yes, uh, there's a good question, excellent question. As I highlighted in my slides presentation just now that what we can do right, right now is to bring down the central government, which is the military government for good. Because uh, Burma, like I mentioned, Burma has been part of, you know, dictatorship and military culture since the country was founded on military principle. So what the US can do is, you know, and also work with neighboring, Asian country like ASEAN, but unfortunately ASEAN, they have a non-interference policy, but US as a leading democracy in the world, you know, they are pressuring other people to do democracy. They have to also punish ASEAN. Whoever do business with, you know, Burma or, you know, have, you know, confiscate all their assets, you know, maybe send a strong message to ASEAN, bring down the central government. But as far as Aung San Suu Kyi, I don't know whether there's any hope for her because, you know, to tell you the truth, you know, the NLDs also partially also was founded on military principle. NLD, one of the founders of NLD was also a former military, you know, general too. So when NLD was founded, they was also founded on military principle. Like the Burma has a strong history of military principle. So what as international community can do right now is to, we have to bring down the central government, you know, the military, wipe out the military for good, ensure hold all the general accountable, ensure there's no military in Burma, but thanks to the new generation, you know, they all have open-minded generation Z and all the new generation, they are doing all the protests. Uh, we are standing with them. We want Burma to end, you know, the dictatorship for good. Military shouldn't have any power at all, 
But unfortunately, when Aung San Suu Kyi was in power, she gave the military 25% seats. He agreed to it. So, you know, that's like, you know, asking for more trouble. So what now, since the coup already happened, the Burma people, they are collectively speaking out. We as an international community, we all also have to speak out as a Rohingya diaspora. Uh, we want to see democracy in Burma, no doubt. True democracy, not partially democracy or not fake democracy, just for the majority Burma or majority Buddhists, all ethnic minority have to be represented. So what we can do is, you know, we have to... Uh, send a strong petition, send a strong message to Biden administration, and, you know, let them know that not just sanction Burma, because sanction is not going to work. Because Burma has been sanctioned since uh, during Bush administration. You know, Bush has been sanctioned. There's so many administrations already sanctioned them, but China, Russia, they are supporting them. You know, perhaps we might have to take a different route, you know, hold the general accountable, make them come to the international criminal court and give them, you know, that this is not acceptable then we Rohingya will have a chance, you know, to survive in Burma. If not, you know, we forever will be stuck in a third country like Bangladesh. Of course, we want to go back to our indigenous land, which is in Arkan, you know, but because of this uh, Burmese, uh, Burmese government playing cat and mouse game with so many people, so we cannot trust them anymore. So we have to bring down the junta government for good and install a new interim government there, Burma, with the, under the supervision of United Nation and international community. Thank you, Kokonang. Uh, our next question, um, it's also, what can Taiwanese or overseas Taiwanese do to stand with Hong Kong people? What kind of alliance can be built? Charles? Can you repeat the question, please? What can Taiwanese or Taiwanese overseas do to stand with Hong Kong people? What kind of alliance can be built? Um, I think alliances are very important. And I hope that Taiwanese and Hong Kongers can build a stronger tie in pushing each other's agenda. And so um, in, in this sense, I think um, in Hong Kong Forum has a pretty good working relationship with Papa and that we can help uh, lobby for each other's um, initiatives in the Congress. Um, but in also in terms of uh, local rallies, uh, Hong Kongers are having rallies every now and then. Well, we have died down a little bit during the pandemic, but um, I'm sure that it will resume very soon after when the situation improves. And um, we always welcome the participation of Taiwanese in our rallies. Um, locally. Um, and um, as I mentioned, is that it is not only a Hong Kong, uh, it's not only a United States issue, actually, um, it's a worldwide issue. And Hong Kongers are everywhere in the world. And in every single country, we have groups that are doing initiatives with our governments on talking about the plight of Hong Kong people, uh, the situation in Hong Kong, and we also uh, work on warning our government about the atrocities from uh, the Beijing government and how that their, um, their work is actually um, affecting the politics within their own country as well. And so I hope that we can join forces, uh, coordinate better and share information, especially about how the Chinese government is affecting politics in our own countries, in our countries, like, say, in the United States, in the uh, United Kingdom, in Canada, etc. That is all the time we have for this event. Uh, thank you for everybody. I would like to thank everyone who has presented and participated and joined us today for Government Atrocities Prevention Seminar. Uh, we we'll hope to have all of you again uh, next year. Uh, thank you, Charles, for answering that last question too. And helping. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you. Stay safe. Yeah. Tosha, Tosha.
。Okay. I do want to urge everyone to、uh, sign the petitions. If if you、uh, get to read the petitions, just、uh, make sure that you also share them as well. And I want to thank all the presenters for their hard work and also their input. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.